I'm pleased to introduce our guest today. Steve Wallach has been involved in, in computing from, from mini computers to supercomputers for a long time. Uh, he started in the, in the 70s working on Data General's MB8000, one of the architects of that system, uh, which, which has the distinction, as far as I know, of being the only computer development that was the subject of a, of a fairly well-selling book in the general market that even won a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, he went from there via a little detour to found Convex Computers, which which was uh, probably no, the first, first uh, mini supercomputer companies, and We're the first. as far as I know, the only really successful one. Uh, it eventually sold out to HP, where he stayed for a little while. He's been through a couple of ventures since then, and about three years ago started Convey Computer, which was, was sort of in response to uh, DOD, DOE, um, studies of exascale computing and, and various things there, which we'll hear a little bit about today. Um, he's won, uh, he has won a number of awards and other honors, the most recent of which is the 2008 Seymour uh, Cray Award for uh, innovation in, in high performance computing. And today we'll, he's going to talk about exascale computing and, and things related to that. Okay, Steve. thank you. Uh, I like to keep my presentations as interactive. I realize usually you have questions at the end, but if someone believes they have a question or a critique and, want, and would like to start a discussion or debate after slide two, go for it, okay? So, uh, acknowledge, uh, when I did this, and I also worked with someone who now works at uh, Oak Ridge, and uh, as you can see, we were perhaps overzealous on what we did. So I'm going to discuss first HPC software and then how that leads to exascale computing. Uh, in the old times, we were told, beware of Greeks bearing gifts, if you remember that. Well, today, in today's world, we can contemporize it as beware of geeks bearing gifts. And what I mean by that is most of the world in high performance computing has been very floating point intensive, working with Fortran and C, et cetera. But today, the HPC world is now moving to what people are calling data intensive. And data intensive is very different. Uh, one, you tend not to have any floating point or minimal. Secondly, the paradigms are very different than the classic HPC. And I'm not sure whether this is good or bad for general HPC, because all the people who will be thinking about solvers and floating point are now thinking more about how do I do graphs, how do I do multi-threading and everything else. And we'll see that a little bit later. So what problems are we trying to solve? Um, you can see what they are. The major thing is you need processor performance is leveling. The clock cycles are kind of constant. So how do we get more performance? Obviously, it's through various levels of parallelism. Massive parallel processing, multi-threading. To me, this is deja vu. And based on the audience, maybe five people will know who Yogi Berra was. Two, OK. Yogi Berra is credited with saying it's deja vu all over again. Basically, the same problems we're trying to solve today, people were trying to solve in the early 80s, except this with a VAX. How do I make a VAX run faster as opposed to how do I make an x86 run faster? Or how do I make an ARM run faster? And what we've seen is you need more performance. So people looking at GPUs. They used to look at IBM cell, FPGAs. So what we basically have is heterogeneous computing again. And some of the reasons that they both succeeded and failed in 1980 people who are not old enough are falling into the same traps again as they did 30 years ago. And we'll discuss some of that. Current languages, Fortran, C. I, I was telling Jim, how many people here under 40 have ever programmed in Fortran? 
One? One and a half, okay. I proved my point. Today, <laughs> we're gonna check driver's licenses afterward. The point here is Fortran, which is still in many cases the standard, especially for old, older code, for scientific, is not basically taught anymore in school. Compilers in many cases are not, newer compilers are not dealing with Fortran. Well, we still have a lot of code that's written in Fortran. But of course today we have C, C++, Intel is C star, or C sharp is Microsoft, Stream C, UPC, etc. But we have a bump in the road. The standard HPC benchmark is matrix multiplier. Any machine, the first thing you test with a vectorizing compiler or whatever is how well do you do on matrix multipliers? So this is an example of programming in CUDA, which is a language developed by NVIDIA to do high performance computing. So this is an example of programming in Fortran generating CUDA. And what is four lines of Fortran because it's a, an attached processor, you have to move the data back and forth. You have to do mallets. Uh, you have to create explicit threading, etc. This is for a simple program. You know, if you have 50,000 lines of code, it's basically impossible to do this. So, as a way of perhaps uh, showing my distaste for this, I developed the term pornographic programming. You can't define it, but you know it when you see it. And Cooter is, is an example of that for me. So this is something from a colleague at Los Alamos. He gave me permission to use this, this slide as presentation. As you can see, there are three people getting to the end of the hurdles and one person who's um, tripped over every hurdle. So he says, find the accelerator. So that's the accelerator. Now it goes, find the programmer. That's the program. So there's always a trade-off between programmer productivity and CPU performance. And the question everyone has to ask is, where do they want to be in that trade-off? As computers get cheaper and cheaper and people get more expensive either to hire or productivity, you really want to emphasize more compute user cycles, not computer cycles, because computer cycles are becoming throwaways. So what's the programming model? Today, of course, we've moved away. We, we just don't have Fortran and C. We have Java, JavaScript, server-side, things you all know. And the reason I had tongue-in-cheek beware of geeks bearing gifts is a colleague found from this website the following chart of, and you know, it's statistics, you can draw, draw your own conclusions, that showed the language that's on the fastest rise is Objective-C. Well, the reason is simple. If I have an iPhone and I come out of college and I want to start a company and do an app, I'm going to program, make program something for an iPhone or Android as opposed to anything else. And you can see the other languages. So this is the, the top 20. Now what's interesting is MATLAB, which I happen to like a lot, is an interpretive-based matrix language, and, and you can see how it, it's used. The bottom 44, and what's interesting is COBOL is higher than Fortran. <laughs> so again, you know, take these statistics with a grain of salt, but it shows you where the effort is, and even RPG, most people don't even know what RPG is needs report generator for those who are old and who would like to know a piece of trivia. Can you say where is it? RPG was designed mainly for a card system. But uh, the point here is to see which languages and you know take it at face right, but it makes sense that languages like Objective C, etc., would be on the rise more used in other languages. So here's another s statement about languages, and then we'll move into some hardware. Some of you, I'm sure, went to UC Berkeley and may have had Kathy Yellick as a teacher. 
So when she was at a keynote speaker at Shalazan some years ago, uh, she put this slide up. First, when vector machines were king, we had parallel languages with loop annotations. That means ignore vector dependency. Then we had SIMD machines. We had to create new languages. Then we had shared memory. We created new paradigms. So at the end, the clusters, we created MPI. So her tagline is, we've been at the mercy of hardware. Will the architects listen now? So my colleague had to keep me from standing up. But if, if he would have let me stand up, I would have said no. And what this means is, when you design a computer system from scratch, you really like to have a code design in hardware and software. Uh, one of the people here uh, surprised to see we actually worked together at Data General. And it pretty much was a code design, and it, and it worked. And the reason it worked is, one, it was a team of maybe 30, 40 people. We trusted each other. And we had a common objective and goal in mind. It was not an adversarial relationship, though other people may have tried to make it that way. Um, and it worked out well. So the key here is, sometimes, when we do define new languages, we don't necessarily take into, into account what the consequences on the hardware, that it may run too slow, or the software may not be as resilient as we would like because the hardware is not a good match for the software. So now we get into exascale. The Department of Energy, I was at several workshops, created their view is they'd like to get to exascale by the decade, end of the decade, 2020. And they have asked for potentially a billion dollars to help develop the new technology to do this. <laughs> so my view is I'll do it for a lot less. And I'm going to show you my take on how to do this. And um, the key here is what scared a lot of people is they believe to get an exascale, they're going to have to have one billion independent threads. So you talk about embarrassing levels of parallelism. I think a billion is more than embarrassing. I don't know what the right uh, adjective would be. So part of their summary is this says uh, 2019. They want a peak of an exaflop. It will consume 20 megawatts. System memory will be 50 petabytes. A particular node is 10 teraflops. And you could see all this. Oh, but here's the, here's the gotcha. MTBF is 24 hours. So tongue in cheek, they say reason has to be so fast is so you have the answer before it fails. I'm sorry? Yeah. Well, part of the problem is when you run something as sophisticated as it's not clear you know when you get the wrong answer other than running the problem three times. Remember, you have a billion threads, but it's, it's a one application. So it's a time to solution of one application that could take a billion threads. And that's a major part of the research is how to build in resiliency for these applications. So let me tell you how I'm going to approach this. UC Berkeley, and actually I did this quite independently, said, you know something? We can take all these applications and put them into 13 bins, which we're going to call a motif. And here's the URL of the hub. So they said it's finite state machines, combinatorial graph traversal, structured grid, map reduce, etc. That's the rows. The columns are various applications, speech, music, uh, games, database and said, rather than just haphazardly designing architect architectures, we should have very application-specific approaches. And contrary to what people may think, rather than 100 different paradigms, we can reduce it to 13. Well, that's pretty significant, because doing 13 paradigms as opposed to 100 is, is a lot more tenable. So quite independently, I took their chart, I, and I know Patterson reasonably well. I said, no, you got to extend it to take your paradigms, but then it's 
what memory systems do you need to get optimum performance? So certain applications, like a structured grid, can deal with caches, but draft, uh, graph tra traversal generally doesn't want to cache because it's all over memory. So there's another third dimension, if you will. And then, of course, you have compiler complexity from uh, single instruction, single data, SIMD, MIMD, and a full custom uh, personality. So if you really want to do a good job at this, this is, this is you know, what I think is a reasonable approach. A lot of other people are, share the same thing. So how do we create architectures to do this when to create a full custom architecture could cost a billion dollars in five years? So what happened is when I got involved in this, I said, I think I know how to do this. And here's what I did. I started a company, Convex. So the first company was Convex. You know, it was a no-brainer. Let's take X, go to Y. Though so certain former employees said, no, it should have been Convex. And we go on and on, have fun with that. Uh, the Convex environment was much like this. So it was pretty much a free-for-all and, and things. So what we did is we started out with the x86 ISA. And with Intel's approval, Intel's an investor in my company, our company, we create different what we call personalities that look like extensions to the x86 architecture. And they're somewhat mutually exclusive. So we have instructions that just help data mining, sorting, and treat. But you're not going to use that for computational fluid dynamics, for example. And things that do bit logical, et cetera. And I'll show you certain examples of this and show you the performance you obtain. So what we did is we actually have our own compilers, which we generate the x86 instruction set and what we call the custom ISA. And because we're shared virtual memory, unlike CUDA, you don't have to move data back and forth. It's cache coherent virtual memory, no different than every other machine I ever designed with floating point units, et cetera. This is what we're sh we've been shipping this for 18 months. It's a 2U box. The bottom is a standard Intel's 1U server board. Second box is a coprocessor with uh, an attachment on, right now on the front side bus. Inside, the way we get a lot of our performance is we have a memory system that doesn't use caches. It's a highly interleaved memory system, and it's 31, the prime number 31 way interleave. And the reason is I got sick and tired of recoding FFTs for power two, and as I was discussing with other people, most people who create arrays tend to be 256 by 256 by 256. And for those who have any experience, you make the leading dimension 257 runs four times faster or something. And so we have very high bandwidth memory system. I'll show you some uh, benchmarks. And this is works the cache coherent with the x86 memory. Now, what we've done to help people develop their instruction sets, whether some of our customers or we've done this ourselves, we create what we call a PDK, which says, let us define the interface to memory, to the x86, et cetera. Because you don't want to worry about that. We have a whole bunch of logic designers who know how to do that. And day one with our compilers, it's initially based on Open64, but we'll, we'll get into that. We let you define in a table your instructions. So the compiler, when it sees a construct, A equals Google1.bc, it automatically generates the instruction Google1.bc. So to take this one step further, we're now doing the following. One of the problems in, do, in doing that, especially if you're a compiler person, you'll understand this. If you have new instructions, you don't know what the side effects are. Can, the pet, can global flow go over the instruction? Does it modify anything else? So what we've done is created a compiler where you define what the graph transformations can be done with that instruction which means it makes the development of a unique personality pretty straightforward, supporting a compile and go model with C, C++, or Fortran. Probably shouldn't mention Fortran because no one here programs a Fortran, but C or C++. 
which means in a relatively quick way, you can add new instructions that are optimized, sharing all of the memory, and compile and go to get the benefit of the acceleration. Um, well, let's see how complex. Once you're trained to use it, it can take a day or two per instruction. I don't think I'd want to have a hardware engineer do it, but you know, if you, if you, the question is how complex is the definition? If you understand what it means to have side effects, uh, uh, how many operands, where the result goes, you know, uh, things like that. It's relatively straightforward. So here's a, an example of a benchmark. This is just simply uh, uh, load and store memory where the indices are sparse as opposed to stride and one or whatever. So because we actually have, it's 31, 31 interleave, which I'll just, uh, if, for the moment, let's skip it. On a cache-based machine, as the stride goes beyond one, the performance basically flatlines to one or two gigabytes a second because you're breaking cache on every reference. Because we don't have caches, and this is against a Halem single core, we basically have flat at 45 gigabytes a second. And of course, when it's, the stride is 31 or 62, the performance drops down. But in actual operation or in running user code, this doesn't happen all that frequently. Most of the time, you're over here at the flat line. This is an example of a custom personality to do a search kernel for bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is a lot of sorting and searching. You, you take your genome, you're looking for certain pairs and other things. So we did this for our beta test customer, UCSD, San Diego. And we created fetching substrings, updates, etc. We have four, 40 what we call state machines. And as you can see, the benchmark or the performance is, in some cases, approaching over 10 times an 8-core Intel, over 100 times a single core. Yep? Will you be saying something about the uh, memory and consistency properties? It's a... Yeah, I can do that. I'll do, let me do that right now. Well, okay. Look, I'm going to go back. Cause in particular, how that affects the compiler. I understand. Trust me, I understand that question. Cause, okay, let's do with this one. It's the same virtual address space. We implement virtual memory in the code processor. It's a 64-bit virtual memory. It is identical to the x86-64. We don't do the i32e or all this other stuff. It's cache coherent. You do a write from Intel, and if we have the data, we update it, and vice versa. So from the viewpoint of a compiler, it looks like an SMP. The simple takeaway, it's an SMP. Did that answer your question? It does, uh, with the, the leaving a lot of open questions around maintaining tag consistency and pipeline links. Uh, Whether or not there's any explicit software protection required for any of the pipeline. The answer is zero. There's no software protection. This is the team who built this is has been with me for 25 years. We built SMPs. We understand all the issues of outer order execution, uh, strong ordering, weak ordering. You can go on and on and on. Um, the answer is it's an SMP, period. Uh, there's, no, there's no exceptions. If there's an exception, we fix it. And one of the ways we're able to do that, to be quite candid, is Intel's an investor. We've had access to, let's say, data and how their stuff works that unless you have access to them, there's no way you'd ever get that right. So we understand to do certain things, if you don't set CSR 10 with bit 5 followed quickly by CSR 50 with bit 53, it won't work, if I can give you examples. So, no, no, it's, it's like an SMP, period. This gentleman had a question.
if you allow the software to shrink to the memory space at uh, basically one flat area, yes. a power consumption of the data will be able to make up your power consumption. So, how does the software get to manage its data? Right now, a question about data movement and power consumption. Um, there's no magic. We give you pragmas to say where the data should go. I've yet to see a compiler algorithm that says, put it here versus here. The virtual memory hides it. The real data consum power consumption, I'm sorry, is when you access a particular memory, not moving it, but running that benchmark where you get 50 gigabytes a second because you have all memory working all the time. That's where the power consumption is. Uh, here's an example of something we just released for graphs. And um, what we did is we created a personality that can support up to 8,000 threads simultaneously. Since our memory system can support out of order execution going to your question, with weak ordering, we, can have, we have tags on the data coming back. So if you reference one, two, three, four, five, six, and four comes back, we know where in the queue four goes because it has because that memory reference has a tag. Okay. So what we've done is create something for something called the De Bruyne graph, which is something used in bioinformatics, where we do, where we have hash tables going to memory to look at the overlap of segments. This is bioinformatics. And uh, the memory system is the same, but it's a different personality. And the way we do this is we have FPGAs actually doing the execution. So for each personality, we create a different bit file for the FPGAs. And that's how we create these different instruction sets that are mutually exclusive. So now, how do I take this to be an exascale system? You know, most people say, well, we'll take Moore's Law, and Moore's, if Moore's Law says in eight years it's going to be ten times faster, that's what they'll do. That's the wrong way to do it. So what I did is I assumed a whole bunch of somewhat independent variables, uh, floating point IP, how many arithmetic engines, language-directed design, and I did a, basically what you would do Bayesian decision analysis to see how this factors out. So everyone knows Moore's Law that says every two years, twice the logic, not necessarily twice the clock rate or anything. So I'm going to say by 2020, I'm going to assume a mean factor of seven, sigma plus or minus two. So seven times performance, same clock rate, same internal architecture. A lot of people never heard of Rock's law. Arthur Rock was the venture capitalist that started Intel. And he said that the cost of a semiconductor chip fab doubles every four years. And in fact, that's kind of happening. And that explains why, in some sense, you could argue the number of independent fabs are going down because the cost is so expensive that unless you have the volume, you, you can't have your own fab. So you have foundries like TSMC, et cetera. So this is, most people have never heard of this, but this is sort of what drives the economic aspect of Moore's Law. So application specific. A standard benchmark in HPC is LinPad, which is basically matrix solving. When people had vector machines like NEC, Cray, this is going back to 1993, they got 95% of peak or 90% of peak. What was called the Earth Simulator with 5100 processors at 87%. In the last impact, uh, LinPad, you know, it's got a lot of press. The, Chinese, mainland Chinese, had the highest lint pack out of 86,000 cores, but only got 53% of peak. So it was a brute force way of getting the performance as opposed to efficiency. So you talk about power consumption. That's a lot more power efficient because it was in, an inefficient approach to solving the problem. So if we can get 90% of peak, we actually have better power performance. So how do you do that? One thing we're doing at Conde is, is we're creating matrix accumulators. You know, vector machines had vector accumulators, and you hear the term vector processing. But all the applications are really matrices. The reason it was called vector processing, because when it came out, let's say with the Cray-1, 
there wasn't enough physical memory to really have a matrix. It was really 1D and 2D processing. Now that's not the issue. So if you have a matrix accumulator, you can get much more efficient coding. And this is an example of what I mean of, I'd rather put the SRAMs into application-specific machine state as opposed to cache and let the compilers deal with matrix accumulators or some other machine structure that could be appropriate to an application. So it's under your control. So in this case, it does a stencil in one operation. That's a very typical operation for a lot of code. And if you do that, you actually get a, an excess of 90% efficiency. Right now, floating point is uh, that is not hard IP. We hope in the future. And tomorrow, I'm making a presentation Xilinx, so this should get a, a, a giggle there. That will get more performance. Then you can take trade off some of memory and put arithmetic units in memory. More and more, you hear the notion of PIM, processor in memory. That is, let's put the processing closer to memory because of the latency in going to physical memory. So this would be similar to that type of mechanism. So my view is, since, as you see, I'm very much interested in what compilers can do in programmer productivity, I said, here's, here's my matrix multiply written in UPC. You explicitly say there's 16,000 nodes. And I believe a compiler can take this and generate the, the code directly if all my nodes have a shared virtual memory. That's not cache coherent. When I have 16,000 nodes, I don't need cache coherency. <coughs> not that I, I, I can't. I, don't, I can't afford to. And by having a language like UPC where you say how many nodes, and so it's global physical, global virtual, but not sh cache coherent. And that's where a lot of the industry is moving in that direction. You can develop a compiler that can automatically parallelize and vectorize that without going to any language extensions. So you do all the math, Moore's law, matrix arithmetics, etc. You get a mean of 800 times what is today. Best case, 2300. Worst case, 448. And the system, what it looks like, is um, uses 24 megawatts, 32 terabytes of memory per node, so 288 petabytes. Physical memory is about 60% of the power. But that gets you an exascale machine. Uh, the way you hook it together, I believe each node will have optics coming out for the interconnect. So I actually used a slide five years ago when I was the keynote speaker at Supercomputing. And people thought, you know, this is another, I was crazy, with another, with a metric of 0.1 bytes per peak flop. Well, just recently, IBM announced that they developed, basically, that technology in the research group, which shows processor, memory, and optical routing going off chip. The general consensus is if you want high bandwidth going distance, you have to go optics. Now, this is not a product yet, but it just shows you the type of effort that's being spent to, in fact, do something like that. So ultimately, an exaflop system could look like this. 16,000 nodes. Um, you have to consider that 10 meters is 50 nanosecond delay and an optical switch. So before I conclude, these are some of the things I've been saying. Heterogeneous here to say, smarter memory systems, etc. Now I'm going to take a total different argument and debate myself, which I do quite frequently. Someone asked me a year and a half ago if I was doing yet another company, Convex Computers, once Convey does its thing, you know, X, Y, Z. And I, in 2009, I presented this at a workshop in Annapolis, Maryland. So I said, well, if I'm going to do Convex Computer, I'm going to design the iPhone 6.0. I mean, that's where all the action is, a, I'm sorry, an Android. So we have to look at the user interface, the processor, external communications. Now, again, I did this a year and a half ago. So my idea of the antenna, that goes away. iPhone antenna issue goes away. So I said, what's going to be in 2020? Well, 
if you're a smartphone, the power budget is 300 milliwatts, typically. I believe it'll either be ARM or IA64. I think all other ISAs will either be gone or niche players. There'll be a 64-bit virtual address space, certainly. That's true here, and ARM has announced you know, publicly that they, that's in development. This is now in the smartphone. Two to four gigabytes of physical memory, an FPGA coprocessor to add special functions. You may have a terabyte of flash, and you may have 10 to 20 gigaflops of real star rate performance for 3D video driving the DSP performance. In some sense, you know, what exists on a laptop will exist on a smartphone, if not more so. I don't think there's any debate about that. So if I have this technology, what do I do with it? Well, Xilinx just announced, in essence, something similar. An ARM dual core with an FPGA, which can have common accelerators integrated to within the instruction set of memory. And this is a simple chip. So now the question is, if I want to build an exascale computer, should I build it the first way with optical memory? Or should I, you know, put a million of those guys? And I think the answer is you may have both. Because certain applications may look better with a million of those. Certain applications may work better with 16,000 high-performance nodes. Now, this is something I throw in. It's funny. Terry Dowell is here, so we'll get a kick out of this. I honestly believe 64 bits is not enough in the virtual address space. Uh, what I find interesting is the communications people have taken the lead on this. When they ran out of bits in IPv4, they said, let's just end this forever and do IPv6 and have 64-bit UIDs. And life becomes wonderful, hopefully, forever. Maybe whenever we're born, we'll have much like a social security number, we'll have an IPv6. Uh, you know, when people get born, they, you know what they do today when they get born? They get a social security number and a frequent flyer number. So it wouldn't surprise me if we can deal with the privacy issues and other issues with that we'll have an IPv6 number. Whether it happens or not, I don't know, but it makes sense to me. So anyway, it's a unique name. And if we do that and have a virtual address space that, let's say, has IPv6 in it, we can actually unify communications and computing. Because when we reference something, it's the same way of referencing it, whether it's on a cell phone or on a computer system or on a network. And I think that really helps the whole programming, productivity, and everything else. And in fact, there was a patent issued in 1987 which kind of discusses that. So it's not a new idea. It's just a question of it hasn't been implemented yet. So just finally, I always end with Dilbert, because Dilbert has is smarter than everyone in this building. As a lead software engineer, I'll give you the first unit of our 10,000 copy production run. Wow, I wish we designed it with all the features listed on the box. That would have been awesome. I'll put this with the other reminders of how life could have been excellent. Thank you. I've been speaking pretty fast to make sure I have time at the end to open it to any questions. Do you have any questions? Yeah. So you made a comment about how we should be um, focusing on program productivity. And uh, one observation is the problems will grow until they run out of so, you know, we're always going to be somebody pushing the edge. Okay, so, so tell me something I don't know. If you're not pushing the edge from where I come from, you're not doing a good job. When someone comes into me and says, oh, I've done that five times before, I haven't done it in a week. Certain things, that's fine. If it's like something else, I'm, going, I'm not pushing him or her enough. I find that the smartest people are the ones who, I'm going to use your term, I don't like the term, push. I say, what gets my juices going, someone says, no one's ever done that before, and we 
we really would like to have it done. Oh, no one's done it before. I guess my point was that you've got to be careful not to exclude people into get into the fence. You end up in one of these situations where, you know, five percent of your job you can't do on that machine, so you lose the whole machine. I understand. You're asking me a very general question. I'll give you a very general answer. Uh, I have a saying. I, a separate presentation. I have a saying now. The first 90% is easy. It's the second 90% that's difficult. And what you're saying is you're addressing the second that you don't want the second 90% to screw up the first 90%. So I totally agree. In all my experience, I've been designing computers for 30 years. When you ship a product. You're lucky if what you ship achieves 80 to 90% of the objectives you started out with. So if you don't kid yourself, and when you start a project, you say, this project when it ships should have A, B, C, D, E hardware, software. At the end, put a check mark or make a, or, or grade yourself. I would be very surprised if you get more than 90% of, of that list. I mean, if you mark it fairly, and the gentleman is nodding. I'm a hardware guy. Um, okay, what I see from the hardware folks has to be a bigger thing. It's got power consumption, but it's got variability. How does your program work? variability? Could you please help me with what variability means? Uh, process variability. Basically, the system we want the only way to get performance out of the chips, the storage geography, is to expose equal reliability of the quantity of the Okay. My colleagues at Intel, when I have this discussion with them, it's generally trust us. Okay, I, I know I know that's not an answer you want, but uh, I do not have a PhD in material science or physics, so I'm not sure I can give you the right answer. Uh, it's very clear one of the reasons why fabs are going from four billion dollars and eight billion dollars, etc., is to address some of those issues. That how do I go from 28 nanometers to 22 to 18? You know. Etc. And one of the ways they do that and still have reliable products is have new process technology that could cost billions of dollars to develop. And some of these machines, I've seen them. If you walk around a fab, you know, a particular wafer tester that I've seen, it's as big as a bus. It's $50 million. And they have multiple because they have to have multiple. And, and that's replicated, you know, n times. Let alone if you ever walked in a fab, you know, I've gone in a bunny suit, you know, you all dress down. And, uh, this is serious business. And, you know, it may get to the point, someone once said tongue in cheek, not me, that maybe we'll have to put a fab on the moon where there's no gravity because the deposition may be affected by gra gravitational forces. You know, you, know, you know, one of the things is, I, I, I mentioned to people, just like I asked about how many people know Fortran, in 1960 there was a whole slew of papers called Designing Reliable Machines Built Out of Unreliable Components. And a lot of people have never seen those papers because unless they were scanned or you went to school like I did, you never knew people wrote papers like that. And it's amazing, like, I never once at a conference, this discussion, I said, maybe we should go to majority vote logic or threshold logic. What do you mean? You know, it's not it's not Boolean, but it's a rep, it's a duplication within a, a gate itself or another approach to it. And we may have to do that. I honestly, I'm sorry. See, I have this I have this belief to be quite candid. I want to make the hardware more. If the if, if hardware complexity reduces. Software complexity, that's I want to know. So like when you ask the question about cache coherency, because of the, the example there with CUDA, I don't want that because that ends. That doesn't help me. So you have, yeah. How would you get to a factor of a thousand from a factor of eight that your density increase? I'm sorry, I don't quite understand that question. Uh, I was uh, earlier in the previous slide, you had the factor of a thousand performance increase. 
Yeah, I took all, all these numbers. I said, like, Moore's Law gets me this. And, of course, Moore's Law gets me this. What is the other effect of a company coming from? And why can't you get the uh, hundreds, 10,000 operations actually today? Okay, let's get. Okay, this is the math I used. Several years ago, I did this analysis for some people in the government about using LIMPAC as a predictor of Moore's Law. And when I took the published numbers, it was much more than doubling every two years, let's say. So I looked at the micros, and the micro width went from 16 bits to 32 bits to 64 bits, so there was a memory bandwidth aspect. And how fast you could do a multiply went from eight cycles to four cycles to like a pipeline. So you can't just use uh, gates. So what I said is a factor of seven is Moore's law. A factor of four is using matrix arithmetics versus vector arithmetics. A factor of eight is having hardware float as opposed to FPGA float. Another factor was putting processor in memory. That's what this line is, user visible pipelines per node. So you take 7 times 4 times 0 0.9 times 8 times 4. And I did this again because when I was in an audience like this, the first thing I would do when I would see this is I multiply it out to see if the presenter got the wrong answer. And you get nominally a mean of 800 times. You multiply all the numbers out. Because in the current implementation using FPGAs, where you have to use LUTs to create multiply add. The pipeline is like 13 cycles, etc. If you have hard, by hard I mean custom logic to do that, that drops down by factors, orders of magnitude. Really does. If you want. That's right. And so I'm saying if I had FPG, but FPGAs have custom logic islands, like a DSP is custom logic. So if I had a custom logic 64-bit Fuse, multiply, add, I would see that benefit. I, I, off on the side, I could tell you that, this, that is not a random number. It's based on a lot of detailed analysis. The platonic subtrace of communication, yeah, is that part of the subtrace of communication? Is that part of the subtrace of communication? Yeah, okay. The question is the, is the IBM, that example of the substrate part of uh, yes and no. It's not predicated on what IBM is doing. But I firmly believe that to get the bandwidth, okay, if you're doing high level compute, there's several metrics of how, how much bandwidth per node you need based on flops. The desired bandwidth is 0.1 bytes per second per peak flop. If you work out the numbers, if I want to get a or so out of a node. Sure, I can use copper, maybe, but or or single lambda optics, if I can use that term. But that becomes more difficult to build. Where today, long haul, if I go from San Francisco to New York, I'm over a terabit fiber that's using w, DWDM, dense weight division multiplexing. I. There's no reason why that technology, well, the only reason is cost, but from a technology perspective, that technology appropriately reduced in size and cost could just as easily be done node per node. And there are benefits of optics generally in lower power, and they don't have RFI. I recall, I remember in my first company, we had optical links and they were put over fluorescent lights. I go, are you crazy? He goes, no, it's optics. So there's a benefit in the resiliency aspect, not just the power and bandwidth. And that, you know, I can, even though it's not the same, and people always say oh, I'm saying the wrong thing, I can use optical links between my receivers. Yeah, you know, it's a very low bandwidth, but it's still optical. And I think you see more and more. What happened is the dot-com bust hurt the use of optics in computers because a lot of technology being put into optical transceivers and stuff. And when the dot-com bust happened, a lot of that 
investment went away pretty rapidly. Gentleman in back. Uh, so to bring this back briefly to the uh, project issue, um, I mean, it is kind of cool to be able to sort of you know, get inside the, the energy domain that you know, solve a little bit of partial problem with the operator. It's kind of cool. But nevertheless, would I be correct in assuming that you're still looking at a much lower issue rate in terms of requesting new operations of your process and not like to the native instruction of the x86? Well, okay. Rather than trying to repeat the question, the way you get the performance, let's just say it's step back. If I have a vector computer, one instruction issues potentially hundreds or thousands of, lo of equivalent loads of stores. So yeah, yeah. And That's a certain character problem. So, so there's two. Let's do character by character. One is a SIMD approach. We, we already we one instruction to generate hundreds or thousands of loads. So the instruction issue rate is not as relevant. It's more the operand issue rate. The other approach is multi-threading, where, like an example I gave with the graphs, we have 8,000 threads running at the same time. So in that case, what counts in performance is not the instruction issue rate, but the thread synchronization and how many threads can I go? And can the memory system support 8,000 8, threads? What I'm actually trying to get at here is it isn't so much that. I mean, yes, you can track performance in the system. I'm just sort of looking at this continuum in terms of to what degree is the operand issue rate going to be associated with the If you, the question is, how can you map kernels into instructions, or what's its efficiency, or whatever? Ideally, you'd like to have one kernel you know, be responsible for 90 95% of the execution. And most, sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. Right. I, I understand. So the reason I show the example of the graphs is that's an example where it's, let's call it a flat profile. That is, one kernel does not, but it can be multi-threaded. So you get the benefit of the 100x speed up because now you have 8,000 threads executing at the same time, hashing into memory. So that's an example of having, think of it as 8,000 x86 threads. It's not x86, but so therefore, the, the profile is flat among the instructions of the x86, but your application at a higher level is embarrassingly parallel between threads. And that's fine. And that's what we do with the graph thing. It, 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 it's not a kernel. It's the application is multi-threaded. That's the, if I can use, use your term, that's the kernel. So how do we create a multi-threaded environment? And that's what we've done. Did I, I'm sorry, did I answer your question? Okay. Well, I, I guess I would follow on with you. Uh, you mentioned that you use a weaker consistency model for uh, the memory database. Uh, and often you use a large thread counts to hide latency right. or indirect access to look up. And I'm just wondering if, as you bring those two things together, whether that means you can really solve a variety of graph problems or you can solve a well, okay, without knowing the test, I obviously can't answer. I can only tell you, I was having a discussion with Jim. When we have looked at graph problems, for the one case I showed where each kernel, each thread is doing hash lookup to memory, it scales linearly. Another approach for graphs, which is different than threading, and certain applications can use adjacency matrices where you have bits. So someone, for example, may want to have a, a bit matrix that's a billion rows and 64,000 columns, which is a, a different way of representing perhaps a network, which is what you're using for graphs. And with our, let's say, 
limited experience, but we do have actual experience. And unfortunately, I can't go into the inappropriate to go into the details. There are certain phases of the program. So to get to your question about kernels, there may be phase A of, of the program that may work with threads and graphs. Phase B may work with adjacency matrices because uh, there's an isomorphism back and forth. Or for application A, you do A, and application B, you do the other approach. And um, the only thing that's common among both of them is if you don't have a high-performance memory system, that can deal with thousands of outstanding loads and stores, it doesn't work. It doesn't scale. But you need to deal with those thousands of outstanding loads and stores structured in such a way that you don't have lots of numbers. I can give you some more answers, but I can't. But yes, you're right about the conflict. A lot of the conflict is a result of the way you program it. So it you know, it's garbage in, garbage out, if I can use that term. You know, if you program in the crummy way, the best compiler can unravel it. And we can tell you, you know, this doesn't look, you know, I can't do this optimization of this, but I can't restructure it. Um, and um, in my experience doing this for performance, If you build a computer that has a memory, I always start with the memory system. Sooner or later in your application, it tends to be memory being limited. I don't care. AL user for free now. So how do you build a memory system that can have thousands of outstanding loads and store that scales? So the first step is, if you have a cache, it probably doesn't work. Because these threads are not going to have cache affinity anymore. All 8,000. And if you have more, even this works. Then you have all our designers have been working with me for 25 years. We just, this is normal for vector machines. It so happens that memory system can be used for things other than vectors. And I can, all I can tell you is a lot of customers running production applications using that approach. And in the case I showed, rather than the threads being a instruction sequence, it was a finite state machine. But it's irrelevant. It, it's, it, it's, it's more of the way we sync things up and create, and create the threads, and et cetera. That's really where the uh, magic is. I've been, I've been asked that question a thousand times in the last 30 years. And show me the code. It all depends. I've seen code where you know, 50,000 lines of code, an hour later it runs. I've seen 50,000 lines of code where three months later it runs. I mean, it runs officially. I have a saying here. When you benchmark a machine, you tend to benchmark the analyst as much as you benchmark the system. And a lot of the tools, compiler tools and debugging tools, in many cases are used more by the analyst than the end user. And I've had many cases where someone says, you know, the compiler should do that. And if you have a small team, you pick, you, you, you pick up, you go, hey, Harry and Joan, you want to come here for a second? You see this? That's not really good. You want to fix that? But Steve, I said, no, you, you didn't hear my lips. Said, when are you going to have that optimization in here? And it happens. That's when you have highly motivated people who understand it. And that's a good reason. I mean, I don't, I don't try to be flippant. But if you're in a high performance game, you have to have that type of mentality. If you don't, you lose. Because you saw my last bullet. User productivity, the machine which is the easiest to program will work. I've been saying that for 30 years, and it's absolutely right. When my first company, Convex, started, we made a VAX compatible compiler. We could take people's 100,000 lines of VAX code, 
and in an hour have it running. That came to us and said, you must be building a VAX compatible machine, we're going to sue you. I said, no, we're not. I remember the compiler guys coming to me, God, do we have to implement this way VAX is doing true and false? And it violates the standard. I go, yeah, that's really terrible. Please do it. I don't know what else to say. I was on the IEEE committee, so I used to go to Berkeley and Kahan. So it's just around decimal? Huh? It's just around decimal? And it won't have COBOL either. I believe that's We actually have, first of all, the IBM Tower PC has decimal. Um, we actually have one person to answer for that. And, uh, it was the bank, of course, because you, know, you can't have round off. I understand. It, hopefully, it's more than one day. To be candid, uh, one of the things that we, I a lot of the stuff and this is a question about coverage and resiliency. Uh, we still buy the DRAMs. We have no impact. You know, pick up the, go buy them from Micron or whomever. If 60% of the logic is is DRAMs, yeah, we can do ECC and all this other stuff. But if you have two errors or whatever, uh, we still have a micro, which we have no control over. Uh, and but we do have potential. That as soon as I said, I said I know he's going to say this. We do have potential control. And look, there have been a lot of known cases of uh, when you have systems, especially not at sea level, but at 7,000 feet. We shipped SBI boxes to Colorado. Okay. And talk about, I'll give you the, another example. Once my wife and I went to Hawaii visiting. Maui, and at the telescope plant on the mountain, it turns out, I didn't know, this was 10,200 feet, and computers only spec at 10,000 feet, so the, their workstations did not meet the, the spec, if you will. So if they broke, there was no warranty. I, I, so you know, there's a lot of issues that, that, that come up like that. I'm sorry? Right, but there's certain... Things, I guess we're trying to say that environmental issues, you know, if it's a 10,000 feet or Colorado or wherever, that, that could have impact on today's systems, let alone. And it's certainly true, once it, in fact, showers in, someone from Intel had a, a photo micrograph that overlaid a, a, a virus on a chip that is you know, some sort of cold virus, whatever. The virus was the equivalent of like 100 gates or something. That was his way of saying, hey guys, we're getting so small that we're dealing at you know, some virus, you know, that is medical virus level. And as I said, I don't have, I don't understand material science. I have to you know, offer anything other than that. It's well known. I assume the process people, that's part of their specification. Getting back to this uh, uh, design process, uh, how close is the coupling between your main processors, uh, your FPGA processors, and the uh, same memory, which presumably will also execute stuff? Uh, are these independent threads? Are they compiler and compiler? Compiler doesn't know any of the compiler. Simply sees this as a as a Van Neumann machine. 
I'm going to say it again. The cash coherency, the shared virtual memory, is all done in hardware. We run Linux. We had to modify about a dozen Linux kernels to, you know, to, with BIOS and stuff to deal with you know, those issues. It's real simple. You can take an A.out file. It'll be as clear as I can. And we actually create fat binaries. So when the compiler would generate all x86 code or x86 code coprocessor, you execute the A.out file. If he doesn't see the coprocessor, just execute the fat binary. If it sees the coprocessor, when it sees coprocessor instructions, which look like extended x86. I call it the pedal chart. It goes, I won't tell you how we do that. It goes, oh, it's not here, it's there. Go start that gun. It's, it can either be done instruction by instruction or subroutine by subroutine. Generally, it's more subroutine by subroutine rather than instruction by instruction. But either one works. Either one works. Okay. Well, I thank you. I hope we, uh, this hour uh, thirty seconds. Thank you very much. Thank you.